Verse 51. <coughs> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <clears throat> Verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you. It's so encouraging to know that your word has gone forth out already in this place, in the Sunday school hour with the children and adults. We've sung praises unto thy name. We pray that our gathering here, our worship, help us to worship in spirit and truth, that it would be pleasing unto you, Heavenly Father. God, you know the strugglings I've had with this message, things that... Uh, wife and I have talked about, prayed about here. Father, we always need your grace, and I'm thankful for that time when you remind us of it in a special and powerful way. God, we need your Holy Spirit to move. I need your filling to minister the word to your church this morning. My dear wife needs your filling to minister the word and sign that which is preached. Father, give that grace, please. Be with those in the nursery as well. Be with thy spirit and help caring for the children of God. I thank you for each one here, and I pray that you would speak to every heart. Truly, that you would meet with us once again, each one individually, all of us as a church. Might we know that you have been with us, that you've spoken to us, helped us, by your word, once again, for our good and for your glory. Christ might be exalted in all things. That you be glorified. Father, help us to be careful to thank you and praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I don't have an outline on the overhead today for you, so desire this week. I'm tired of the message this morning. Give thanks. God is both known and near. Give thanks. God is both known and near. Uh, I wasn't ready to let, to let go of the Thanksgiving season yet. <laughs> I didn't get that. I preached on missions last week and I wanted to preach on Thanksgiving, but you know what? Uh, what better think to thank God for them for His coming, amen, that we celebrated Christmas, amen. Of course, Calvary is the reason that He came. That's, that that's, gives us the cause to thanks for, them, for His resurrection also from the dead. So, let's encourage us to be thankful. God is both known uh, and near. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as he was traveling on his missionary journeys, he that many kinds of strange beliefs and uh, of course the nations around them were polytheistic they had many gods uh, we don't read uh, too much about uh, atheists in the Bible uh, there is one particular passage that speaks of the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God <laughs> uh, but Paul was preaching in Athens and and they had all kinds of gods they worshipped. And he says in his speaking there in Acts 17, 23, As I passed by, I beheld your devotions, altars and stuff that they had built to many gods. 
I found an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And of course he went from there and he told them how this God in heaven, the only true God, is the one who indeed has sent his son to die on the cross and rise again. And uh, he is also going to be the judge of the earth. And uh, knowing God, being thankful uh, for what he's done, knowing him, knowing he's near. Uh, fear of the unknown is an anxiety that's common among people. Uh, <clears throat> what's the future going to bring? What will my health be? What will my finances be in the future? Will we be safe? violence. What comes after death? These things people often fear about. Fear. And this can rob us of a thankful spirit. Sure. You can't be always fearful about what's, what, what, what's, what's coming that you don't know about. You can't always be fearful of the unknown and still have a thankful spirit. It robs us of that. I'm so thankful that God's made himself known. Amen. Many people live their whole lives in fear of things that may that may have may happen to them, but they never did. <laughs> Most things we fear never happen. Uh, it can rob us of that thankful spirit. <clears throat> in these nations that worship many gods, they feared many gods. They feared that if they didn't appease the gods. They would be punished somehow uh, in the next <coughs> life, and perhaps miss blessings in this life. Many kinds of strange fears they had. But Paul showed them that there's only one God, and He alone is to be worshipped and feared in a reverential sense. Uh, he's the one true God that created the heaven and earth. He hasn't hidden Himself. Rather, He's clearly shown Himself to us. His creation, along with all the truth that man needs to live this short life here and now, and to prepare for the next life, which is beyond the grave, God has shown us in His Word and through His prophets. Agnostics argue, agnostics are people saying, well, you can't, uh, they say that uh, you can't know God. Because if there is a God, then He's greater than us. And we're only human. And if there is a God, we, He obviously lives in a different realm than we do. If He exists, we can't know Him. How, how could we know Him? We can't go to where He is. That's what agnostics say. Moses, Moses and Paul both addressed this kind of belief in the Scriptures. Throughout the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul clearly made uh, the gospel of God, as he titled it there, No, He made it known clearly what God had done to save mankind. He made it known clearly that Christ had died on the cross for our sins and risen again. And uh, he made that known. When God appeared to Moses, he led Israel out of Egypt. He made himself known, didn't he? In Deuteronomy 30.11, well, let me, just, let me just back up. <clears throat> we'll come back to Moses. We'll go back to Romans. That's all right. I hadn't caught up anyway. Amen. So. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's preaching the gospel. Teaching about Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> he says in 
Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now remember, Christ's ministry on earth was recent in Paul's time. Christ had died and risen again. Many that saw him alive were, uh, after he was again were still alive. And uh, it was known that, that their, their message, what they were put out was he was risen again. And by the way, all those who hated him couldn't produce what? A body. A body. They never could produce a body. Kind of like some trying to find a crime against our, our, our president today in, in, in some <laughs> circumstances. They just they can't seem to produce one. <laughs> They couldn't produce a body. Oh, so they made, had big stories in there. Oh, well, the disciples just wanted them to see him so bad they hallucinated. And that's what they saw. That's what they're talking about when they saw, say, they saw him for 40 days after he was alive. They were all just hallucinating together. <laughs> oh, he just swooned on the cross. And the disciples, even though they had the, the world army, the power of the world power, the Roman army guarding the tomb, they came and stole his body away by night. Yeah, that's that group that was hiding in the room after he got killed, remember, with the doors locked? Yeah, they came and stole him away. Yeah, right. Yeah. And of all kinds of stories. But he rose up. He rose again. Right. Yeah. And, and the apostle, uh, Paul, was, had preached that clearly. And he says... Uh, he says, uh, uh, Moses describes righteousness of the law. He says, but he says, verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall ascend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? What saith it? The Lord is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thine heart. And it's the word of faith which we preach. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe with thine heart that hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Paul is saying to the agnostics who say we can't know God, say not, say not, who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from above? Oh, you're preaching that he came down from heaven? Well, who's going to bring him down from heaven now to tell us about that? Prove that. You know, Paul's saying, forget it. You have enough facts around you to know this and believe it now. God's no, God don't have to prove himself again. He already did send him down from heaven. And, 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 the, and, and the leaders of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and, and convinced the crowd to crucify him. And the tomb was empty on the third day. And these very ones who saw him were now willing to give their lives and, uh, uh, and, and die for that testimony that they had seen him risen. Paul said, don't even go there. You have enough evidence to know the Messiah was here. And now God requires you what? To believe. To believe. The word is very nigh that you thy mouth and in thine heart. You've seen it. You've heard it. He was here preaching on this earth. And you remember the history of the miracles and such. And it's interesting that Paul, when he puts them down, he references Moses. See, Moses had kind of that same kind of meeting with God, too. God met him at the bush. He was called to lead Israel out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai. Remember, Paul referred to that. He said uh, in Romans... Uh, 
he referred to Moses in Romans uh, 10 there. He says, uh, Moses described the righteousness of the law. God then with Moses too, in a clear way. In Deuteronomy 30, 11, we read, Moses says, For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. Listen to this. Sounds just, well, this is what Paul is referring to. It is not in heaven thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Or, uh, neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. What was Moses saying? Well, you see, when Moses received those commandments, you remember what happened? God came down to Mount Sinai. And the Bible says, in Exodus 24, that Moses was there. And if I count correctly, there, was, there were 75 others there with him. And they saw the glory of God. This is before Moses and Joshua went further up the mount to get the commandments. They saw the God of Israel, Exodus 24.10. And the Bible says, And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, that was the 70 that were there besides him, it was Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and Joshua also. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, also they saw God in the eat and drink. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up unto, into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables and a stone and a law. You see, they couldn't say, Well, how do you know these commandments are from God? Because God, the Bible says, God spoke those words to them while they were waiting before Moses ever went up into the mount to get them written on the table. They heard it with their own ears. They saw the fire, they saw the flame. And so Moses said, don't even go there. You see, who shall go over the sea to tell us? You see, and the sea was mentioned, represented the great unknown then. They hadn't sailed uh, across the seas. Oh yeah, it, it's a, a bomb beyond the sea somewhere. We can't figure it out. Oh, it's beyond heaven somewhere. We can't figure it out. Moses said, don't even try to pull it. <laughs> Why? Because God came down to heaven to meet here with you. You heard his voice. <laughs> you saw the flame and the fire. That's kind of what Paul's saying. But after what God's just done, don't even pull it. Don't even try that. He has appeared in a mighty way. <clears throat> you see, God has shown us clearly where, he, where we came from, why we're here, where we're going. God has made known His will and His ways and His works in children of man. That's right. I want to look at three, appearance, three, four appearances of God that ought to make us thankful and rejoice in Christians that would want to live uh, for His glory. Uh, first, the first appearance. Give thanks. God is both known and near. The first appearance. Uh, God came to Adam in the garden and showed us the sting of sin. Number one, God came to Adam in the garden and showed us the sting of sin. Remember that meeting? God had given Adam and Eve that one commandment. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day what? That thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And you remember what happened. Eve was deceived. And Adam sinned willfully. And sin came into the world. And the Bible says, So that death passed upon all men, for that all is sin. You remember that? And God came to meet with them, apparently like He'd done before. Remember that meeting? The Bible says, uh, <clears throat> After they ate the fruit, it says the eyes of them both were open 
And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What a beautiful meeting that those must have been prior to that. <laughs> but this time, the Bible says, And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. You see, the thing is, God hadn't been hiding from us. But ever since the Garden of Eden, man's been trying to hide from God. Right? <laughs> you see, he's appeared in power and glory in multiple ways. And he continues reaching out to mankind. They went and hid themselves. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. They knew they obeyed, they disobeyed God's command at that meeting there. You see, what does sin do? Sin separates us from God, doesn't it? Uh, what that happened after their sin? Well, uh, they died spiritually that day. And by the way, physical death came into the world. <laughs> physical death. Not long thereafter, they would see uh, one of their sons murder the other. And they would see death for the first time when Cain slew Abel. And that came into the world because of sin. The sting of death. Uh, shortly there, in Genesis 3.23, Therefore the Lord God sent, sent him forth, Adam, from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. They were cast out of the garden where they had that wonderful fellowship with God. Sin breaks our fellowship with God. God came to Adam in the garden and showed us the sting of sin in that meeting there. And the Bible says uh, uh, the wages of sin is death. And the Bible says in Revelation 20, 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That there were some sad results in that meeting, wasn't there? And by the way, it wasn't God's fault, was it? Man's been trying to hide from God. Listen, you're either going to seek forget God for the forgiveness of your sins and cleanse it, or you're going to hide and try to hide from one or the other. <laughs> and that's what's going on today. God's appearance in that garden left an indelible mark on Adam's conscience. See, what came there, what came in that, in that first meeting, what came was guilt and the grave. Guilt and the grave. God left an indelible mark on Adam's conscience. His conscience now told him he was guilty before God, and for the first time in his life he felt shame. And so did Eve, I'm sure. Romans 1 teaches us that this mark of guilt and shame in our conscience is a testimony. See, some try to argue today that man wasn't created in the image of God. Rather, God was created in the imaginations of men. And that's what they say. I went out uh, to the deer feed at the house the other day. And I caught one of the does at the feeder kicking a, kicking a little one that wasn't hers. So that she could have all the so that she could have all the food to herself. When she saw me, she blushed <laughs> and let the little one back over to the dish. <laughs> what are you looking at me like that for? <laughs> what are you looking at me that looking at me like that for? See, here's the thing: you just had a meeting with God. He just met with you. Because your own conscience told you that story was ridiculous. See, because animals don't have shame for their sins. People, or the animals don't have sins or shame. People do. Amen. Amen. And you just, God, you just had a meeting with God, and He spoke to you in your conscience that it was that, that it was man that was created in the image of God and not animals. That was put in you and in me. Uh, and it's in there according to Romans 1. We have that knowledge. What a meeting. That, that guilt comes, doesn't it? 
God meets with us. Romans 1.20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, whatsoever out of excuse. He, he met with us. He met with us. He read there in Romans, O oh death, where is thy sting? He showed us the sting of death in the garden with that wonderful meeting. Let's consider another meeting. Point number two. God came to Moses on Mount Sinai and showed us the strength of sin. God came to Adam in the garden and he, and he, and he, uh, and he showed us <clears throat> uh, the sting of sin. God comes to Moses on Mount Sinai and he showed us what? The strength of sin. Remember that meeting? When those elders and all that were up there on that uh, mount before Moses and Joshua went up, went up, went up further alone, uh, the Bible says, "And the sight of the Lord, uh, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel." <clears throat> Deuteronomy five twenty two. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly. That was the, those. 75, six counting Moses that were assembled there in the mount. Out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a great voice. And he added no more. He spoke to them the Ten Commandments. He would write on the stone. Moses went up, Exodus 24, 12. The Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone. Here it is. And a law and commandments. God gave Moses a law and commandments, which I have written, but thou mayest teach them. What does 1 Corinthians 15, 56 say? The sting of death is sin, but what? The strength of sin is the law. By the way, what happened right after Moses received the law? Israel and their leaders, by the way, they already heard the law audibly from God. They'd already heard, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And what did they do? They made him a golden calf. What was God showing them? I'm going to show you how strong your sin problem is. You see, men might think, well, yeah, but he just didn't know. If they had a little bit more information. No, God was clear with them. Some people may think, well, if we just had more, more education, we wouldn't do wrong. No, God told them. God says, I'm going to show you how strong the sin nature is in the human being. Even when I tell you what's right and what's good, and even when I show you what's evil, there are times when you will still choose to do evil. That's how strong your sin nature is. That's the strength of sin. There's not a person in it. By the way, both of those kinds of sins, those kinds of sins are represented in the garden. Eve was kind of deceived and kind of weak. And she sinned in that respect. Adam's sin wasn't that way. His was woeful. The Bible, as a matter of fact, very clearly says Adam was not deceived. One was in the trend. Adam was, Adam was not deceived, the Bible says. He knew. He believed God. He knew that Eve was going to die. Adam made a willful choice. I'd rather have broken fellowship with God than lose my wife. And he willfully picked another over God. You see. You see, in that second meeting there, God showed us the strength of sin. It's so strong uh, that we would willfully disobey. And not only do wrong, but we all have, at one time or another, willingly done that which we know is wrong. That was that second meeting. The sin of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. <clears throat> and then thirdly and finally, the third meeting. Well, there's one more. That, that God came to Jerusalem on Mount Calvary and showed us what? Our Savior from sin. Or we could say He showed us the solution for our sin. What did... John the Baptist says, 
He saw Christ walking along the shores there. The next day, John see it, Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, what? Which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Look unto me and be ye saved, God says. Uh, I'm the be saved, for I, I am God and there is none else. There's only one Savior, and that's God. Yeah. By the way, He became a man. And He came to earth and died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says in Romans 5, 6, For when we were what? Yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. By the way, before I get too far, um, I'll probably get this book. Um, but when God came to Mount Sinai and showed us the strength of our sin, He also left an indelible mark upon the earth. That's a picture of Mount Jebel Musa in Arabia. That means the mountain of Moses. We've studied this before, had a film, watched a film on it. Uh, more, than, more than likely, the actual, the actual location of the biblical Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Uh, the biblical Mount Sinai was not on the Sinai Peninsula. The Bible says Mount Sinai in the Bible was what? Where? In Arabia. In Arabia. And this mountain is in Arabia. God came down as what? A consuming fire upon that mound. And that's what the locals call there in, 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 in Arabia. That mountain they call it the mountain means the mountain of Moses. I'm going to get that book there. We had a lot of uh, different things. We've done some studies on that upon the <coughs> Egypt crossing, crossing the Red Sea and such. God left the mark on the earth when he did all those things, folks. You see, he's not hiding from us, <laughs> is he? It's, we, it's us who've been trying to hide from him since the garden. Uh, peering at Mount Calvary. Uh, whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live in a righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Here's your sin in the garden of Eden. The sting of sin, the guilt, and the grave that goes along with it. By the way, I don't know how much Adam fully understood, but that included the second death. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. It's a second death. That first meeting. Here it is. By the way, I'm going to give you my law. I'm going to show you just how strong your problem is. <coughs> I'll give you my law and you won't even obey me. But now God says, I love you. I'm going to show you my solution. You see that man on the cross? All the sins of the world past, all the sins of the world past unto him. All the sins of the world future unto him. All the sins that ever mankind would ever commit would be put upon Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Once and for all. And God was saying, watch what I do for you, world. You've all sinned. But I had this plan from the beginning. Because I knew you, even in your best efforts you couldn't be, be what I originally created you to be after you disobeyed me. And so I made way for you. I sent my son to live a perfect life, offer that perfect life up to me. He willingly did that. And at, in the process of doing that, I put all sins upon him. He took care of them there. See, you know what God did at Calvary? He made the world savable. But he planned that before Calvary. See, folks might have been thinking the Jews and others, well, to get to God, we've got to, we've got to keep the law and be as good as we can. Of course, that's the, that's the average thought today, isn't it? God knew that would never work because he requires perfection in those things. And so what did God do? He says, I'm going to make it not how well you do, but on who you believe. I'm going to make that the issue. I can justify however I want. That's the argument in Romans chapter 9. Here's how I've decided to justify. Not by how well you do, but by who you believe in. And that's why John said, what? Behold the Lamb of God. You look to Jesus Christ for your salvation, because he's got to take away your sins. 
And by the way, when he does, he claims his year, uh, and you are righteous positionally in his eyes, and you receive eternal life and a home in heaven. God says, that's how I decided to do it. Isn't God a wonderful God? What a meeting. What a meeting. What a meeting. Uh, by the way, and the Bible says, Romans 3, 21, now... The righteousness of God without the law. How many of you are glad about that? The righteousness of God doesn't include the law. I am. I am. The righteousness of God without the law has nothing to do with how well you do stuff <coughs> or obey. It has everything to do with who you believe on and when you repent of your sins and realize you're helpless. And you need that salvation. It has everything to do with that. You see God tells us what? The world's condemned. Why? Because they what? Sin? No. They believe not on Him. You see, God made a way that we could go by believing on, the, on His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen and He testified the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. By the way, God, uh, He left a mark in history when Jesus Christ came. We read much about it right here. By the way, did you know did you know there's such thing, no such thing as prehistoric? We have all of history recorded from day one, folks. Mm -hmm. By the God who made this place. Right. So there's no, so there was nothing we, we don't have we don't have a time uh, when uh, when uh, when history goes back and then now history now we have no record of what happened before this day. No we don't we have a record from day one. Mm -hmm. Right here. There's such thing as prehistoric. Yeah. But listen, it's not just God's people. Secular history. Christ made it mark in secular history. Sure. We all know um, Josephus and his and, and, and Jewish antiquities. By the way, not a believer. What does he say? Uh, he records that Jesus was a what? He says uh, that he was a, a, a wise man. They did many wonderful works. And that both Jews and Gentiles followed after him. This is an historian during, his, during, during, during that time who's not a believer. He writes... Uh, uh, He did the, I mentioned wonderful work, those would be miracles, wise teaching. Uh, Cornelius Tacitus, if I'm pronouncing that right, AD 55 to 120, is a Roman historian. Lived through the reign of half a dozen Roman emperors. Uh, he writes of Nero when he was being blamed for the burning of Rome. And, and then Tacitus. Tacitus writes, so to suppress the rumor, he, uh, Nero, falsely charged with guilt and, uh, and, and published with most exquisite, exquisite tortures the persons commonly called Christians who were hated for their enormities. Uh, Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. This man is not a believer. He's just recording the indelible, one of the indelible marks that Christ made on history when he came, you see. Oh, the enemies don't speak well of Jesus, but they can't deny he walked upon the earth. That's right. They can't deny he walked upon the earth. Suetonius, another Roman historian, he writes, uh, uh, as the Jews were making constant disturbances at the instigation of Christus, Claudius expelled them from Rome. That's Bible history. Everywhere Paul went, who followed him? Unbelieving Jews. What did they do? They stirred up all the, all the other Jews and they were causing havoc all through Rome. And the unbelieving Roman historian refers to that as that they were following Christ. Following Christ. History. He made in Delmar. Pliny the Younger, who distinguished from his uncle, uh, Pliny the Elder, 
the pioneer younger uh, governor of Bithynia in Asia, about AD 112. He wrote unto the emperor Trajan to seek advice on how to deal with the problem of Christians in his province. He recounted to Trajan in his letters that he had been killing so many, he was considering whether he should continue killing any, anyone who professed to be a Christian or only certain ones. He explains that he made them bow down to the stat statues of Trajan and curse Christ. He says, which a genuine Christian cannot be induced to do. In the same letter, he says to the people who were being tried, he says, he says about these people he's tried, here's what he writes, he says, they affirmed, these Christians, however, that the whole of their guilt or their error was they were, they, were, they were in the habit on meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verse a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds but never to commit uh, 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 any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny a trust, and when they should be called upon to deliver it, not, not, to, not to deny a trust, when they should be called upon to deliver it up. That's what they confess. We're only being guilty because we're standing for these things. That was a secular historian, folks. That's in secular. If you throw away your Bible, you still haven't thrown away these things I read you. Mm -hmm. He made a mark in history, didn't he? Made a mark in the garden. He made a mark on Mount Sinai. He made a mark on the cross. All the world is to look to him. And then fourthly and finally, God comes to the heart of every believer and shows him his and shows him his salvation from sin. <laughs> you see, it's one thing to know about salvation. It's another thing what? To know it. To know it. To know it. You see, God's, lead, God's meeting leaves a mark on your heart, doesn't it? It leaves a mark on your heart. It's a changed life. For whom he did foreknow, what? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He changes that heart. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And where, what does the Holy Spirit use to grow us? Well, Ephesians 6, 17. We are to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, what? Which is the Word of God. The Word of God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Do you realize that when we lift up this book, we have a word that existed before this planet? And we hold the word that will exist after this planet is transformed. Mm -hmm. Well, don't we? We have the eternal word of God. We have a word of lasting. My grandkids have it. My grandkids' kids will have it. My, my great, 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 great grandkids will have it if the Lord tarries that long. It'll be, it'll be available to every generation. This word God speaks to us in. He speaks, he speaks to our hearts. He used to have a teacher at Bible college. He was, his name was Dr. Davis. He taught uh, professional development. And he did leave the whole, but he, unlike me, he taught kind of slow. <laughs> and but he'd say did you meet God in the word today did you meet God in the word today I can't think of anything more blessed when I'm doing my devotions you can say amen with me and I know God's meant for me and I know God's talking to me. If I didn't know that was possible, I, I, I wouldn't want to be in this place right now, I'll tell you that. 
See, this ministry that I get to do is a blessing, but it's but, but, but it, but something I wouldn't want anything to do with if it didn't have God to help me. Because I can't do it. We can't do the things that God, any of us, can, we can't do the things God calls us to do what? Without His Spirit in us. Amen? Yielding to Him. He lives in me. He meets with me in the Word. He gives me His strength. I realize that He's living in me. And the only thing I can do apart from Him is cloud His presence. So if I'll get out of the way, and He'll know from my heart sincerely that I need Him when it's in the group this morning, or that you and I need Him when we're talking to our neighbor, guess who's going to be there? <laughs> he will be there. He's going to do it through us. And He makes a heart and mark on your heart. By the way, he made a mark on your heart, didn't he? When you got saved, he made a birthmark, didn't he? <laughs> he got born again. Got his spirit to live inside of you. And now, by his grace and by his love, and by his power, we all can but speak forth the word of God to minister to others. All oh, the ways that God has clearly met with us and continues. He's not hiding. It's been, a, been mankind who's trying to hide from him. He's made himself clearly known. By the way, he's near. Paul, after he explained to them who the unknown God, God was, he says, he's known. He says he has made of one blood all nations of men to put his will on the face of the earth. Uh, he's determined uh, uh, all the times. He controls the times and the bounds of their habitation. And, and he, what's the Bible say? That they should seek the Lord and have the might feel after him and find him. Here it is. Though he be not what? He be not, he be not far from every one of us. I got good news for you. Even the lost person today. God is near you. He's not hiding from you. You're hiding from him. Because somewhere along the line, I, 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 would, I would be surprised if God hadn't spoken to you about your sin. Reminding you about guilt and the grave, like He did Adam in the garden. Reminding you about your imperfection, like what was said before us at the meeting on Mount Sinai. Reminding us about the way that He's shown on Calvary through the resurrected Christ. He's not hiding. How did Paul finish it? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what three words, shall be saved. Calling upon Jesus Christ. He's always with us. Lord, I'm with you always, even on the end of the world. Amen. I like that. <clears throat> oh, death. <clears throat> where is thy sting? Garden of Eden. Grave, where is thy victory? Death, where is thy death? Death, where's that sting? The strength of sin is law. Mount Sinai. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Calvary, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. In those ways, God has, by the way, and what continues to meet with us. And I, I'm. I'm He's meeting with us in a special way here. And so we're probably going to go home and meet with him too. And thank him for speaking through our hearts. I know I do when I hear others teach. And God speaks to me from his word. Thank him for you know, what he's done in our hearts. And meet with him. Thanks be to God who's given us the victory through our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. All the meetings <laughs> that God has had revealing himself. This book is a is is a preserved and rec preserved record of his what? Progressive revelation to mankind. He's shown us more and more of himself and even he's given us the full revelation that we need to know him and to live for him on this earth and to know all that he wants us to know for now in the, in the expectations of the next life. We can apply those things uh, and draw uh, closer to him. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we give thanks that you have given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God, the thing that 
without any knowledge of you, the thing that we as people fear the most? Probably physical death. And Lord, yet you have shown us there is a greater fear than that. There is an eternity. And without you, we would have faced an eternal death. But I thank you that you have sent your son to die for us and rise again. You've sent your perfect son of God. Who is indeed God in the flesh and he's risen again. And now you have told us that we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God had raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Went on to say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, nobody looking around. Right now, if you don't know for sure if you're going to be going, going to heaven, you can pray a prayer, something like this, be your own words, the magical words in the prayer. But the real, real question is, does your heart mean it? What you pray? You can pray to God something like this. You can pray to the Lord Jesus something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. For my sins, I deserve to die and go to a place that the Bible calls him. I believe that. Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe you're the Son of God. You died for my sins and rose again. And I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me. I want you to help me live for you. Right now, I claim your promise. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I claim that for my own. And by faith, I thank you for hearing me and for forgiving me. But Lord, we thank you that we know that if someone communicated with you from all their heart in that fashion, we promise that you will hear them and you will save them. And if they've done that, you have done that. And I pray that they'd let us know so we can pray for them. They can tell me and others in our church that yeah, I pray to receive Christ as my Savior. Father, we can pray for them and encourage them. I pray they do that. The Bible says, Whosoever believes shall not be ashamed. And so I pray that, uh, that they would let us know. Father, thank you for your, your continual meetings with us. <coughs> One day you're going to meet with us in a way you read. You're going to show us yourself in yet another great way. Paul would read, Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. You shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed. You'll come in the moment. The twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. Lord, we look for your return and you'll meet with us in that way. And I pray you prepare our hearts for that. I thank you for this time of year when we, when we and even much of the world will stop and think about eternal and spiritual things. Help us not to miss opportunities we may have to, to speak of Christ, maybe for another, maybe more this year, this time of year than any other times of the year, Father. Just help us to be faithful witnesses. Father, uh, I thank you for this church. For how good you've been to me, far beyond what I would ever deserve. Father, I thank you and praise you. Put these things before you. Ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know the charge of your time. This is this morning. Amen.